good evening, and welcome to another spooky episode of Kodo Cinema, the podcast show where I talk about movies. I bid you welcome as your host, the man, the myth, the horror, the legend, Mark Kodo, a.k.a. Kodo Man. Yep, here we are. We are doing another episode of Kodo Cinema for Kodo Cinema Horror Month. And now for the, now for this episode, I got another movie to talk about for my next episode of Kodo Cinema Horror Month, and that movie will be Twilight Zone the Movie. A few reasons why I want to talk about this movie is because, one, Twilight Zone the Movie came out in 1983, so it's basically its 40th anniversary. Another reason because I actually seen this movie a few times, and in my opinion, I thought it was a pretty it was a pretty decent film. I mean, I'm not saying it's a great film but i say I, I find it as a decent film to watch and then of course uh another reason one of the more obvious reasons because uh, many people uh, many people including myself remember this movie for its helicopter accident that took the lives of actor vic morrow and two and two child actors now the film itself as i mentioned came out in 1983 well, it's obviously a science fiction film, but it's also it does have its horror elements to it, and it's also an anthology film. So the film is split into different segments. The film itself was produced by Steven Spielberg and John Landis. It's based on Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone TV show of the same name, which came out in 1959 and it ran until 1964. The film features features four stories. That were actually directed by John Landis, Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, and George Miller. John Landis, his segment is an original story which was created for the, for the film, while segments directed by Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, and George Miller are all remakes of episodes from, from the original show. The film's cast includes Dan Aykroyd, Albert Brooks, Scatman Crothers, John Lithgow, Vic Morrow, and Kathleen Quinlan. With also with also a few cast members from from the original series includes Burgess Meredith, Patricia Berry, Peter Brocko, Murray Mathenson, Kevin McCarthy, Bill Mummy, and William Schallert, to which they all appear in the film. With Burgess Meredith taking Rod Serling's place as the narrator, because Rod Serling, who who is who created the Twilight Zone TV show, served as the narrator and. Bur and where does Burgess Meredith come come into play? Well, Burgess Meredith made a few appearances in the Twilight Zone TV TV show, so so he came, so he was able to come in to take over take over the narration for Rod Serling, and also another reason why Burgess Meredith took over the narration for the Twilight Zone movies because Rod Serling himself passed away in June on June twenty eighth of nineteen seventy five which is basically a few years before the Twilight Zone movie ever came into production. Now, as I mentioned, the, many people remember this movie because of its uh, t because of its helicopter accident. Fortunately, when the film came out in uh, on June 24th of 1983, the film received mixed reviews. So despite the whole accident, just despite the whole accident, the film will go on to receive mixed reviews. It and many people praised uh, Joe Dante and George Miller's uh, segment, while many people criticize uh, John Landis's segment, including Steven Spielberg's segment. And, dis and despite the controversy and mixed reception, the film the film was a commercial success. It grossed forty two it grossed forty two million dollars on a ten million dollar budget. So it wasn't a total loss. Yeah, it, it wasn't a huge blockbuster hit, but it was a commercial success. So. So the movie still made its money back. I mean, it made $42 million on a $10 million budget. So it wasn't a total loss, but the movie itself still had controversy, especially when it was in production as well. Now, you're all probably wondering, how did I get pulled into uh, into the into the Twilight Zone? Well, to tell you the truth, though, I mean, I never grew, I never seen the actual show, although I have seen a few episodes of the Twilight Zone TV show. Like, I saw... I saw a couple of episodes when I was in school. So when I was in school, not an entire show, but but one of the but, but an episode. But one of the most memorable episodes that I've seen coming out of the show, and I and I watched it on on one of the streaming services. I mean, I forgot it was probably uh, Netflix, but it was the episode of where. But it was the episode titled uh, "Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet," 
where um, where um, where one of the characters comes to an encounterment with a gremlin on an air on an airplane, and that is said that is considered to be. And for what I heard, that episode, Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet, is considered to be the best episode of the of the entire series. And and now that that episode has been remade into into a into into a movie. Well, basically, it has been remade for a segment in the Twilight Zone movie, which was actually fun fact one of the segments that's being directed by George Miller. That's how I got pulled into the the, the Twilight Zone, including this movie itself. Before I break down the movie, I'm just gonna give you, I'm just gonna give you some, give you a brief background on some of the, on some of the directors who, who directed the Twilight Zone movie for the four segments, starting with John Landis, who is also the producer. He directed a segment, he directed the the sec, the first segment called uh, Time Out, which is a partial reworking, but not a full remake of the episode back there. Which involves a man who exits a club after a conversation about about feasibility of time travel to change the past, only to find that he has been transported to the past. And then, and then of course, another, um, and then of course, another classic classic episode is also being thrown into the mix: a quality of mercy, in which an overly impetuous lieutenant finds himself suddenly having swapped places with the enemy for a lesson on empathy. Now, John Landis. Also wrote the segment as well, and as I mentioned, he directed the, the the segment as well, while also being a producer on the entire film. John Landis came off the heels of um, Animal House, The Blues Brothers, and uh, American Werewolf in London. And by the way, Blues Brothers is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, love that movie. Love that movie. John John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd. Those guys are awesome. Like I love that movie. I love that movie. One of my favorite. One of my favorite movies of all time. Still love that movie to this day. Going into the other director, Steven Spielberg. Is there anything to say about Steven Spielberg? Like he's considered to be one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. And this was one of his early. Or this, and this was one of his early films to ever. Uh, do, well, not only to produce but to direct as well. He came off the heels of Jaws. Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and E.T. And then he he went on to direct a segment in the Twilight Zone movie while also be a producer on the film on the entire film as well. So there's so there's something right there. And his segment is a remake of another classic episode called Kick the Can, which was uh, which is which I meant which is as I mentioned directed by Steven Spielberg. And the screenplay for it was written by George Clayton Johnson, Richard Matheson, and Melissa Ma- and, Mel- and Melissa Matheson, who is actually credited as Josh Rogan. Third segment, a good, it's a good life, which was directed by Joe Dante, who came off the heels of uh, of the ho- of the Howling, and um, and he directed that's and he directed the, the segment, it's a good life, from a screenplay by Richard Matheson, based on the short story by. Jerome Bixby, and then the fourth and final segment, which is which I which I've already mentioned, which is basically called Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. Now, Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet is the fourth segment, and and the and that was that is basically a remake of the of the original episode Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet, which was directed by Richard Donner and starred William Shatner. And now George Miller went up twenty thousand feet to direct Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet, that starred John Lithgow. And of course, it also featured a much scare, a much scarier gremlin than the than the original gremlin from from the original Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. And George Miller came off came off the heels of the first two Mad Max movies. So anyway, that's my little background on the direct on the directors and their segments. So now I'm gonna break down the movie. I will I will also talk a little bit about the helicopter accident as well. I'm just gonna be honest with you, the helicopter accident. That deserve that is basically another episode for another day to talk about. I mean, I don't want to spend the entire episode talking about the helicopter accident. Like, I think that topic alone, the helicopter accident topic, deserves an episode of its own. So I will talk briefly about it pretty soon. But let me dive into the movie. So so as of now, you just crossed over into the Twilight Zone movie. So the film opens up with two men driving in a car along a country road late at night. During that scene. Which is actually called the prologue. It's basically a prologue, which stars Albert Brooks as the driver and Dan Aykroyd as the passenger. 
Now they're they're all they're both driving and they're singing and they're singing um, Midnight Special by Creedence Clearwater Revival. They're singing to that, and that's that's how the film opens up. Well, that's how the film starts, and because uh, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks they're singing Let the Midnight Special shine a light on me. Like it it starts off very good. It starts off on a on a very good high note, although. I was confused at one point because I thought this was called the Twilight Zone movie at one point. Like, why are we starting off like that? It turns out it, it actually sets up very well, in my personal opinion. Like, it starts off good, but then at the very end of the segment, it gets it gets real creepy. And and this segment, this segment, the prologue segment, the prologue segment was directed by John Landis, and I heard I heard many people actually enjoyed the prologue segment from this movie. So. So a lot of people, so I heard a lot of people actually like this segment. So anyway, um, Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd were driving, singing to Creedence Clearwater Revival, Let the Midnight Special. So they were so they were singing until the the the, the, the radio and the CD and the D and the sound and the mix and the mixtape or or the V or and the mixtape starts to wear off. So so they had to sit and come up with so they had to they had to like come up with their own with their songs so basically coming up with songs from pop culture like uh, National Geographic Hawaii Five O and then they this they decided to talk about what's what's their favorite episode from the Twilight Zone TV show so they were asking what was the most scary episode from the Twilight Zone Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks were asking questions about were asking questions about it and. This is a nice little. This is this is actually this is actually where it starts to pick up a little bit, and I really enjoy it. And by the way, Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd on screen together, I mean, can't go wrong with that. They they're both they both brought in some pretty good chemistry. Their their chemistry on the road is is very good. And now and now we get to a moment when uh, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks pulled over to the side of the road because um, uh, Dan Aykroyd was gonna tell Albert Brooks, "You want to see stuff really scary," and and by the way, um, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks, their names, their their character names are never mentioned. So basically, Albert Brooks is the driver and Dan Aykroyd is the passenger. So the passenger, Dan Aykroyd's character, a- tells uh, Albert Brooks to pull over because he's gonna, because he's gonna, because he asked him, "Do you want to see something really scary?" So Albert Brooks pulls over to the side of the road, and Dan Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd is like, "Okay." This is gonna be really scary. Are you ready? And then Albert Brooks' character is ready. So Dan Aykroyd turns his turns his head away from Albert Brooks, and then he comes back, and his face is basically a monster. It turns into what looks to be like a ghoulish monster. He shrieks and roars as and as he is attacking the dra- as he's attacking the driver. And then what comes next is the Twilight Zone theme, and that's being played in the background. It's the music that goes. So that's what that's what's being played in the background, and then what we got is is the narration from Burgess Meredith, and and he do, he opens his narration very well, and what we get and what he says is you unlock this door with a key of imagination, beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. So that's that's uh, his opening narration. Like he's introducing the Twilight Zone movie. This is the opening of from the TV show as well. Like like the narrator that Rod Serling introduced. He describes like he 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 introduced the audience to the Twilight Zone through 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 a key of imagination. Beyond it, a dimension of sound, sight. And mind, you're moving into a land of both shadow and substance of things and ideas. So there's like a supernatural thing too, of also being science fiction as well. Like in this opening segment, you see the, you hear the, the the sound of of the window breaking. You even see you even see the eye, you even see a floating eyeball. And and for the, and a little fun fact, um, in this movie, you actually you you see a blanket you miss it you see a blanket you miss it portrait of Rod Serling inside the inside the pupil of the eye. So if you pause at the so when you watch this movie, you get to the eye, you get to the floating eyeball sequence. If you pause at the mo- if you pause at the moment, you you'll see Rod Ser- you'll see a portrait of Rod Serling inside the pupil of that eyeball. 
so, so there's a little fun fact as well. And then of course, um, and then of course you get the key of imagine, and then of course the key of imagination, which is obviously which which obviously obviously shows um, E equals M C squared. So then that's so then that's what happens. So then that's basically the opening narration, and then of course the music end, and then of course the music ends. And by the way, the music for uh, by the way, uh, the the composer who composed the Twilight Zone movie is Jerry Goldsmith, who composed a few episodes of the original Twilight Zone TV show as well. So then we move over to our first segment. The first segment is called Time Out, and as I mentioned. Uh, John Landis directed the first segment and is and is basically a partial rework, but not a full remake of the episode back there. We're also bar we're also borrowing elements from another episode, Quality of Mercy, into into one story. So this is still an original. So this is still an original story, but while also taking pages from a couple of episodes as well. So first segment called Time Out, and the opening narration for Burgess Meredith, he says. You're about to meet an angry man, Mr. William Connor, who carries on his shoulder a chip the size of the national debt. This is a sour man, a lowly man, who's tired of waiting for the breaks that come to others, but never to him, Mr. William Connor, whose own blind hatred is about to catapult him into the darkest corner of the Twilight Zone. So that's the uh, narration, the opening narration for the first segment. Which is basically called Time Out. Bill Connor, or Mr. William Connor, he's being played by Vic Morrill, Vic, or Victor Vic Morrill, but many people call him Vic Morrill. Now, Bill Connor is, a, is bitter after being passed over for a promotion in favor of, of his uh, Jewish uh, co worker named Goldman. Bill Connor is basically angry, he's mad. Like, he didn't get the, promo like, he didn't get the promo promotion just because a co worker of his. his got the promotion like he's jealous like he's really jealous and he walks into a bar after after work with his friends larry larry and ray like he sits down with them he sits down with them he's upset and of course pissed off like 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 his buddies ask him like oh, oh my goodness bill is mad he didn't get the pro like bill didn't get the promotion and then and then bill was like yeah i did not get the promotion that the bastard got the promotion. Like he calls his coworker a bastard. Like, come on, dude. I mean, come on, dude. Like, I will tell you this right now. Um, <laughs> um, listen. Props to Vic Morrow. I've seen th I've seen this movie, and I'll tell you this. Vic Morrow, Vic Morrow did a fantastic job. And despite his, oh my goodness. And yes, yes, he was the he he is the actor who got killed in the helicopter accident. And despite the accident that happened, he still did a he did a fantastic job playing the role. He played the role very well. Like this this character, William Connor, is he's one of those hateful characters. He's a hate he is a he's one of those hateful characters you see. Like you know those character you know you know those hateful characters that you see in movies and TV shows that you just hate. But it's the fact but the actor the actor but the actors do a very good job portraying the character like like Vic Morrow Vic Morrow for example he he's playing a hateful character at the end of the day really like Vic Morrow was doing doing his job he's acting he's acting that's what that's what he's doing and William Connor is a hateful care is a hateful character like he's a hateful character to hate in, in in this movie in this movie just the character not the actor the character not the actor William Connor is all mad. He's all mad, pissed off, upset that that his co-worker Gold, that his co-worker Goldman got the promotion, and and Will, William is at this bar with his buddies, and he sees a he sees a waitress giving him a beer. So he tries to flirt with the waitress, and and he's like, "Why don't you come over here, and cheat me up?" But he gets forceful on 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 the waitress, like he tries to like have the waitress sit on him. But but the waitress is like, don't touch me. And then William's like, okay. Well, I mean, wow. But okay. Anyway, so Will so Will and his buddies are are talking, and then William begins to utter like he utters like like slurs, like racial slurs 
he talked about Jewish people. He talked about uh, black people. And then he also talked about um, East Asian people as well. And 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 he he goes on a rant. Like Mr. William Connor goes on a rant. And I will tell you this right now. Like this this is a PG movie, by the way. Twilight Zone the movie is a PG movie. Now this is before the PG thirteen rating ever came in. And and that was re and here's the thing. That movie released today. That will deserve a hard R. That will deserve a hard R, like hard R rating right there, right? Because, because Mr. William Connor is literally, he's literally, he's basically, he's throwing out racial slurs at the, at the Jewish people, the black people, and the East Asians, and he blames them for America's problems, and he gets this uh, bar patron's attention, who, who is a black man sitting nearby. And asks him to stop. Now, this bar patron who is telling uh, Mr. William Connor to stop, he's being played by Stephen Williams, who who played the one of the cops in the Blues Brothers movie, which was also directed by John Landis. And and this bar patron tells tells uh, Mr. William Connor, "Can you please stop? Please stop." And I will tell you this: this bar patron, he handled this very well. Like. Like he didn't, he didn't, he didn't throw fists. He didn't start a fight. Like he just walks over there calmly and with a stern look on his face, and he says, "Can you please stop this?" Like he is showing restraint. And even before that, he he asks Mr. William Connor. He says, "Excuse me, do you have a problem?" And then Mr. William Connor is like, "Yeah, I got many problems." And then the bar patron is like, "Well, okay, can you please stop? I I don't want to hear about. It. I just don't want to hear hear this." So he goes, so the bar patron goes back, goes back to his table, and then like, but Miss Williams' buddy, Will's buddies were actually were, were were telling telling Will like, like, are you not? Are you trying to get us killed? Like, and then Will goes back to his rant. He goes back to his angry rant about America's problems because Mr. William Connor he fought in the Korean War, and he was really counting on this promotion. He was really counting counting on this promotion for the extra money. So he's also greedy too. So basically, Will and Mr. William Connor is greedy, racist, and sexist too. The character in this movie, not the actor, the character, just the character, okay? Just the character. The character in this movie, the character in this movie is a racist, a sexist, and a greedy man. And a greedy man. He he continues like he continues his rants, and then he and then he reaches and then he reaches bowling pole and says, "How about you hold this?" Like he reaches bowling bowling point when uh when uh w when one of Will's buddies is like calm down hold yourself please and then Will is like how about you hold this and then the bar patron says how about please hold this and then William Connor says back to the bar patron how about please hold this and then William Connor just stands up and leaves the bar and then the bar patron looks at his looks at Will's buddies and says hey I'm really sorry about your buddy like. Props to the bar patron. Like, he handled this situation very well. Like, like I said, he didn't throw fists. He didn't start a fight. He handled this very well. He handled it in a calm but sternful manner. Like, he handled it in a very good, in a, in a very good situation. He handled this very well, even though it was a situation that ended in disaster for, uh, for, uh, William Connor. So, Will walks outside of the bar and he realizes that He's not in his uh, location. He's in um, he's in uh, he's in a different location, and and basically he finds himself in Nazi occupied France during World War Two, and and he sees like Nazi propaganda all up on the on the alley walls, and like he realizes that he's in World War Two. But until until then until then he sees a pair of SS officers patrolling the streets. And they interrogate him, and they they interrogate him and ask him questions like English. Is he is this guy English? Is this guy an Englishman? Is this guy an Englishman? Is is he Amer is he American? And of course, they even they believe that they believe uh, they believe that Mr. William Connor to be Jewish, but well, Mr. William Connor cannot answer because. Because he does not speak Ger he doesn't speak German, and of course the SS officers speak German, so. So they speak. So the SS officers speak German because obviously, uh, obviously, because you know, you know the reason. I mean, cut. I mean, it's pretty obvious. 
But anyway, um, a chase ensues, and Mr. William Connor gets chased by a by a bunch by a bunch of s by the SS officers who even shot who who shot Will in the in the shoulder, and his his shoulder bleeds out. His shoulder bleeds out. So Mr. William Connor runs runs and hides. He hides in this uh, hides in this apartment, and he sees a fan he sees a family inside eating dinner, to which they uh, drop their uh, salads. I mean. Their salad, like the salads, you know, like to eat, to eat, you know, like a salad dish to eat. You know what I'm saying? And Mr. William Connor asks the family, can you please help me? Please help me. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am. But, of course, this lady, the, 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 the lady who is French, she goes out the window, tells the SS officer in French to say that, that this guy, this, um, this Jewish man, this Jewish man is... Um, is in this apartment, like her apartment, by the way. So the SS officers, including a bunch of, uh, including a bunch of soldiers as well, barge right into the house to chase Bill, and Bill ends up on the ledge of a building. And this is also a funny moment too, like when one of the officers actually fell. One of the officers were were about to go out, the, were trying to go on the ledge, but they act, but accidentally fell out of the window and landed in the street. Which is that? Which, to be fair, was actually a pretty funny moment, in my opinion. But then the the two SS officers decided to, you know, play around with Mr. William Connor. They so they sh so they they decided to like shoot shoot at him, but not directly at him, but at the walls, just so he can just so he can like slip and fall. Wow, these SS officers missed more shots than any stormtroopers from Star Wars. So anyway, they keep shooting at him until Mr. William Connor falls and. He falls from the ledge and lands in rural Alabama during the 1950s, and this was in dirt. He lands in dirt in the in the rural in the in the rural lands of Alabama in the 1950s. And I will tell you this: that was a good transition shot from where from how he falls from the ledge and lands in dirt. Like it's a very good transition shot. It's a cut transition, but it, it but it works very well. It works very well because he just jumped. In time, he went forward in times in the 1950s, and and who does he encounter next? None other than a group of KKK members who sees Mr. William Connor as a black man, and one of the KKK members is being played by John Larroquette, Michael Milgron, and Tom Willett. Oh my goodness, this this got me on. This actually got me uncomfortable. Like they were they were going to hang Mr. William Connor. Because the, the those KKK members see Mr. William Connors as a black man. And they were going to hang him. They were going to hang him. But Bill tells him that, no, 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 no. Don't do this. Guys, don't do this. I, I'm, don't do this. I'm a white man. But here's the thing. Mr. William Connor doesn't see that. But the, but the other people do. And I actually found this out right away. Like, like remember. Remember what he said about, um, remember what he said. Remember what Mr. William Connor said about uh, the Jewish people. Uh, the black people and the East Asian people, like he is stepping into their shoes. Like it is showing us, like like this segment is showing us that Mr. William Connor is stepping into the shoes of of the Jewish people, the black people, and the East Asian people. Like that's where he, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. He's stepping into those shoes, like because. Because Mr. William Connor believes, no, no, I, I'm American. I'm, I'm American. I'm a white man. Like he's taking that pride into himself, believing that he's still this, this proud American white man. But no, but no, no, he's stepping into the shoes of the black people, the Jewish people, and the East Asian people. That's what's happening in this segment. So this is, I see that as more as karma for Mr. William Connor. Like. This guy, this dude, this Mr. William Connor, a hateful bigot. Uh, oh my goodness! The list, the list keeps going. Like, like this segment. Oh my goodness. So anyway, uh, Mr. William Connor, like he was about to get hanged by by the by the members of the KKK until a domino effect happens. Like he knocks one of the KKK members, and one of them gets burned alive. He he runs away from them. So and while he's escaping, like they they got the pack of dogs to come come out of the truck and go after Mr. William Connor, including a few, including a few uh, KKK members as well. So Mr. So Mr. William Connor hides in the lake, and they were shooting at him. But thankfully, um, Mr. William Connor ends up in in the jungles of Vietnam. So now he's in the Viet 
So now he's in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and like he, like he's in the he's in the water. He noticed he noticed there's a couple of Vietnamese soldiers um walking marching through the jungle, and then and then a few, couple of minutes later, and then a couple of minutes later, he sees uh, he sees American soldiers walking through, and then they're playing um. They're they're playing another I, I forgot what the song is called but I, but you hear a guitar riff playing in the background of one of the songs. Unfortunately, it's not Fortunate Sons by Creedence Clearwater Revival. I mean, they already did that for a Midnight Special, so I, I guess it's something. It's not Fortunate Sons. It's a different song. I mean, I forgot what the song was called, but you hear but it's got that guitar riff in the background if you hear it. I forgot what it's called. So. Uh, Mr. William Connor sees the American soldiers. He calls them out saying, Hey! Hey! I'm American! Help me, please! I'm American! So, but, unfortunately, unfortunately, the American soldiers see Mr. William Connor as a Vietnamese soldier, so they fired at him. And this is also another funny moment, but it's also an in-joke as well. One, one, of the, one of the American soldiers tells, tells his members, saying, I told you we should not shoot Lieutenant Niedermeyer! Now, now, for those of you who did not hear that quote, I told you we should not shoot Lieutenant Niedermeyer. Um, Niedermeyer is a character is a character from Animal House. Like Lieutenant Niedermeyer is a character from Animal House that John Landis directed as well. Like, um, in 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 the ending of the Animal House, um, there is this quote. There is this like uh, quote of what happens to the characters. And Lieutenant Niedermeyer is one of the characters. It, it says, Lieutenant Niedermeyer, killed by his own soldiers in Vietnam. Yes, you heard that right. Lieutenant Niedermeyer, killed by his own soldiers in Vietnam. That's the in joke in this movie. That was the in the the, the uh, that was the joke in this movie because the American soldiers um told he told like this one American soldier told his other soldiers say, I told you we should not shoot Lieutenant Niedermeyer. That is the character of Niedermeyer from Animal House, that jo the film that John Land is also direct. So then, uh, what happens next? Well, one of the soldiers threw a grenade at uh, Will at William Connor, and it explodes, and it sends him back to Nazi-occupied France. So yes, Mr. William Connor is back in France, and and, uh, and then as he's walking around, the SS officers find him found him again, and they shoot him in the leg. And so what happens next, the SS officers take uh, William Connor to a railroad freight car along with, uh, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, like this, this is, this is pretty tough. Oh my goodness, this is, this is, yeah, 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 oh wow, this segment is really something. Wow. Like this is, like he gets thrown into a railroad freight car along with Jewish prisoners bound for a concentration camp. Mr. William Connor looks up at them too, like he sees them, like he see, like he sees them, realizing that, oh my, like he's realizing that he's in a uh, railroad freight car with um, with the uh, Jewish prisoners, and this is, then they're going to a concentration camp. That is very, very haunting to look at. That's very haunting to look at, by the way, and it, and it's very haunting too, because now Mr. William Connor is, he's he's re like. This is what happens, man. Like he he didn't learn his his lesson. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Like he he like he had this hateful he is this hateful bigot. He held on to that for so long that he now he's any that he just ended up in the footsteps of of the Jewish people, the black people, and the East Asian people as well. Like that's what happened. Like he stepped into the footsteps of the of the pe of the people that he despised, that the people that he despised, and and now he's literally paying the price for it in this segment, Mr. William Connor. And as the freight tr freight train was leaving, Mr. William Connor sees um sees his friends standing outside looking for him. He but and this is from uh, Mr. William Connor's point of view. He screams for help, but they they cannot see or hear hear him as the train pulls away, and that's it. He screams. He keeps on screaming, saying, "Hey, hey, it's me, it's me, guys! Help, 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 help!" 
the train pulls away as he's screaming, and and that's the end of the segment, though. That's the end of the segment that uh, John Landis did. And oh my goodness, this was a that ending was haunting and creepy too. That was creepy and haunting too. And and I will say this right now, that was the segment. The segment from John Landis, it was a haunting segment. But also it was but it was also well acted and well put together and and i and from my point of view like i thought this segment was was decent it was a decent segment however however this segues into my topic that i'm going to talk about which is the helicopter accident and and like i said the helicopter accident from twilight zone the movie deserves an episode of its own so I'm gonna give you a short. I'm gonna give you a short breakdown of the helicopter accident. So here we. So. So here we go. So during the filming of, of the timeout segment directed by John Landis on July 23rd, 1982, at around 2:30 a.m. in the morning, Vic Morrow and two child actors, Micah Dinley, age seven, and Renation Yi Chen, age six died in an accident involving involving a helicopter being used on the set. The two child actors were hired in violation of California law, which prohibits which prohibits child actors from working at night or in proximity proximity to explosions and requires the presence of a teacher or social worker. During the su- su- subsequent trial, John Landis John Landis denied like he admitted that their hiring was wrong, but he literally denied like the capability of this accident. And while he did admit the hiring was wrong. And of course, on top of that, co-director and producer Steven Spielberg was not on set that night. And he was disgusted by Landis's handling of the situation. He ended their friendship publicly and called for the end of the new Hollywood era, where directors had almost complete control over film. And when approached by the press about the accident, he stated, and I quote, no movie is worth dying for. I think people are standing up much more now than ever before. To producers and directors who ask too much, if something isn't safe, it's the right and responsibility of every actor or crew member to yell, cut. Co-director George Miller was so so repulsed by the entire scenario, he abandoned post-production of his segment without announcement, leaving Joe Dante to supervise editing. What also happened was, like, Vic Morrow was decapitated. His head came off. I'm not kidding. This is this is real. This was real. Vic Morrow was decapitated by the helicopter blades. And of course, one of the child actors was also cut off by the helicopter blades too. And and then and then and then the other child was crushed by the helicopter. In fact, there is there is an actual video of the entire accident online. The entire helicopter accident is found online. It's online or it's online. The entire helicopter accident from Twilight Zone the movie is online. There are multiple stories of this accident already online. This involved John Landis, associate producer George Falsey Jr., including including production manager Dan Allingham, pilot Dorsey Wingo, and explosive specialist Paul Stewart. They were tried and acquitted on charges of manslaughter in a nine-month trial in 1986 and 1987. And as a result of the accident, second assistant director Andy House had his name removed from the credits and replaced with the pseudonym Alan Smithy. Even the accident itself became the subject of an episode of the 2020 docuseries Cursed Films. That is bad. That is bad. You know how reckless that is, and the reason how this happened is because, um, well, well, to tell you, to tell you, to, to tell you this, like, uh, the the helicopter pilot was having a hard time flying through the explosions, and the pilot was like, "That's too much. Let's get out of here." But John Landis told the pilot to get low, get lower, lower. Like, John Landis told the helicopter pilot to get low, but. But the helicopter pilot was losing control of the helicopter, landed on t- and it and it decapitated Vic Morrow and and one of the child actors, and it crushed the other other child actor too. That's what really happened. 
And this whole trial lasted in a nine month nine months between nineteen eighty six and nineteen eighty seven. That's that is sad. That is bad, folks. I can't imagine how how reckless that is. That is so 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 reckless of what happened behind the scenes. And I can see why many people didn't like this movie as much because of it. Even though even though it got a mixed reception, I can understand why not that many people why not why a whole lot of people didn't like this movie as much because of it. And I'm surprising too that John Landis still had a film career, still had a career. Like he 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 still went on to direct other films as well prior to the accident. But of course, his film career never recovered after the trial ended. By the way, by the way, like his whole film career didn't recover after the whole trial. So, so yeah, that's that's bad. That's real bad. We're also probably wondering, like, how did that, how did that helicopter sequence, how did that, what was the point of that helicopter sequence? Well, it turns out that the helicopter sequence, the this whole sequence, it was supposed to be, um. Uh, William Connor's redemption. So, like, as he put his differences aside and decided to rescue the two Vietnamese children from the from the helicopter, from this helicopter, and of course the explosions came in the background. So then, like, William Connor was carrying those two children, and what follows is that he was supposed to that he actually ended up back in not, that Nazi occupied France with the children. And what also happens next is that. That the, that the SS officers actually executed the two uh, Vietnamese children in that scene, in that scene, which was supposed to happen. But after the helicopter accident, it was cut. They actually cut the two child actors from this scene because of that accident. So, and then the ending, the ending was still the same. So the ending still had Vic Morrill's character, the ending still had William Connor, Vic Morrill's character, Still put on the freight, still put on the freight train going to that concentration camp. So the ending was still the same, but the helicopter accident feature, featuring the, the two child actors was cut entirely. So, so there's that. So, so that's my short version of of this whole helicopter accident. So that's my short version of it. And um, and like I said, the helicopter accident is an is another topic to talk about in another episode. Now let's move on to the next segment now the next segment is called uh, kick the can which is a uh, remake of the original kick the can episode from the original twilight zone tv show steven spielberg and this segment follows an old man named mr bloom who just moved into sunny so this so this segment as i mentioned directed by steven spielberg and it also has an opening narration from uh, burgess meredith who says it is sometimes said that where there is no hope, there is no life. Case in point, the residents of Sunnyvale Rest Home, where hope is just a memory, but hope just checked into Sunnyvale, disguised as an elderly optimist who carries his magic in a shiny tin can. And case in point, kick the can. So an old man named Mr. Bloom has just moved into Sunnyvale Retirement Home. He listens to the other elders Reminiscences about the joys they experienced in their youth. So basically, remembering like their childhood, and Mister and Bloom insists that being elderly should not and need not prevent them from enjoying life. Mister Bloom remembers like you know childhood, childhood life. So he invites his elderly residents to for, to come outside and play a game called Kick the Can. And this whole Kick the Can situation, they, and this whole kick and this Kick the Can. Is it's basically a fun game, which is relate, which is a game that is related to tag, hide and seek, and capture the flag. But unfortunately, this one elderly resident named Leo Conroy, he objects. He objects, saying that they cannot engage in physical activity because they are all elderly. And and Leo Conroy is being played by Bill Quinn. And I will say this, like like Leo, like Leo just wants to spend his time being old, like. Like he's at the end, of, like he's literally at the point of his life where he is too old for things. But but unfortunately, Mr. Bloom, even though Mr. Bloom says, "Hey, you may be old, but 
you can still have fun. You can still have fun and remember your childhood. Like, how about we play a nice game of kick the can? And Mr. Bloom is being played by uh, Scatman Crothers, who who appear who played uh, Mr. Halloran in Stanley Kubrick's The Shiny. He even voiced one of the cats in in Walt Disney's The Aristo Cats. And of course, he also played an Autobot named Jazz the Autobots in the Transformers TV show and the Transformers um, and the Transformers movie. So Mr. Bloom invites every all, invites all the elderly folks outside to play kick the can while Mr. Conroy is sleeping. Mr. Bloom gathers at the rest of the residents outside and plays the game. And he count he counts to ten. He counts to ten as all as everybody hides. And during that time. They all come out. They all come out. They all come out, and they actually transformed into childhood versions of themselves. They are, and they are ecstatic to be young again, engaging in activities they enjoyed a long time ago. And for for a while, they're actually having fun, like the little kid, like the elderly residents who magically transformed into young kids from you know playing a game of kick the can. And they're basically young again. They're like realizing like I'm young, I'm young, I'm young again. And it's just I will say this, it is a pretty cute moment. This is actually one of the more more heart this is actually one of the more heartwarming segments I see. And I heard a lot of people said that Steven Spielberg's segment is not that great. I mean the people said it was corny. I mean I can understand why some people see that because it's a corny segment, but at the same time, it does. At the same time, it doesn't doesn't it bring you heartwarming ch memories of your childhood too? I mean, Steven Spielberg. I mean, come on, this is Steven Spielberg. I mean, yeah, he has. Don't get me wrong, Steven Spielberg has his own flaws too. Like, don't get me wrong, Steven Spielberg had his own flaws too, but he he. But he knows how to he knows how to direct too. While the, the the elderly folk are young again, they're having a lot of fun, they're ecstatic. But while that's happening, the music by Jerry Goldsmith brings in a very um brings in a whimsical vibe. Like it's very whimsical and, and cute too. Like like he, he really delivers that music very well and, and it's got that little triumphant fanfare a little bit and, and it sounds very triumphant too, like like how like the little how how the elderly folk are are just realizing that they're young kids again, like dun 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 dun, bum 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 bum. That's the fanfare that describes the uh, elderly folks that are that are transported back into kids again, and it's fun too, especially for this uh one for this uh one elderly folk whose name is um Mr. A G. He he. Dang, he literally turns into he turns into a young he turns into a young man who in his uh well, who appears to be in his teens or maybe preteens as I, I should say, being played by be, being played being played by Evan Richards and he's having a lot of fun <laughs> he's having a lot of fun he reminds me a little bit of Peter Pan too I'm pretty sure this is this is where the idea comes in for Spielberg to direct the uh the Peter Pan movie Hook so I'm pretty sure that's where that came in. Well, anyway, while the kids were having fun, um, their thoughts soon turned to practical matters, such as where where they will spend the night, since they will no longer be welcomed in the retirement home, and their families will not recognize them. So they're all wondering that even this one little girl who who um lost her, her wedding ring because well she she turned from an elderly woman back to a to to a young girl. So the kids asked Mr. Bloom to be their true age again and mr bloom grants their wish satisfied that as with himself their minds will remain young like so basically the kids got their wish back so they're basically basically back into uh elderly folks while remaining while having their minds remain young so leo conroy wakes up and notices that um notices the kids well actually before the before the kids transport back to elderly adults Leo Conroy notices it too. Like he sees the kids in the room, and he's like, "Oh my goodness, there are kids in the room. There are kids in the room." So he goes to well, he goes to one of the nurses to tell him that there are kids in the room, 
But unfortunately, but once uh, Leo brings the nurse in the room, all the kids turn back into elderly adults. Except for Mr. A.G., who decides to remain young. And Mr. A.G. just, you know, goes, jumps and goes, was about to go out the window until, Mr. until Leo Conroy asks Mr. A.G. to take him along, to come along. But Mr. But A.G. tells him that that such is impossible. Because Mr. Uh, Conroy, like, he wants to be young again, even though at first, like, he, he rejects the whole idea, but he just, but, he, but now he wants to, like, you know, go back and, and to be young again. But at the very end, it's not possible. So, and it's sad, too. Like, like it seems as though Leo Conroy missed out on all the fun when he was young and little. And especially, like, he's missing out on all the fun. And he's very sad, too. Like, he's sad. Like, he wants to, you know, go back in time and and relive his glory days as a young little boy. Like, he misses that. And trust me, I, I, I miss some of my childhood memories, too. I mean, there are even times where I want to go back to some of my childhood memories. And this is also comes in, this, and this also comes in when some of the elderly folk comfort Leo Conroy, and they comfort him pretty well. They comfort him pretty well. Like, they understand, like, his, his, his pain. They understand his pain, and it's a very heartwarming moment. So the next day, um, Leo Conroy goes outside and kicks the can around the yard, having changed his outlook on, on life. And Mr. Bloom finds 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 Conroy outside, and Mr. Bloom breaks the fourth wall and tells the audience, "He'll get it." Like he meaning that, hey, you may be older, but you can still have fun. You can still have fun, even though, hey, even though, even though you're not a child and even though you're not a young kid anymore. But even as an elderly folk, you can have the mind of a child. You can have the mind of a. You could probably have the mind. You can remember your childhood memories. You can remember. You can remember your childhood memories of what it's like to, you know, have fun outside, have fun playing outside, like kick the can, like kicking the can around. That's a fun. One. That's a fun activity, that, and that's a fun activity to do. And that, that's a fun activity to do, you know, like kick the can. That's a fun activity to do, and that's why Mr. Bloom is like, you'll get it. So then Mr. Bloom departs from Sunnyvale for another retirement home, in order to spread his good-natured magic among other senior citizens. And even before that segment ended, like one of the nurses was looking was looking for Mr. Ag, but what that nurse doesn't realize is that Mr. Ag turned back into a young boy who is basically in his preteens or maybe teenage years or preteens. But but that was a moment I kind of realized that too from the nurse right before the segment ended. And and the music from G, from Jerry Goldsmith fades out and that's basically it. That's the end of segment two. And I know I know the segment from a lot of people they said it was corny, but I thought it was heartwarming. It was a heartwarming segment. I know for a while, a lot of people were saying that it's not that great. Great, it's not. It's not a great segment. It's not that good of a segment, but it's a heartwarming segment. I, I find it as a heartwarming segment. I mean, hey, you know, it's like, and it's got a good me It's got a message too. I can see the message coming around saying that, hey, you may be old. That hey, you you may be old, but you can still remember your You can still remember your youth. What is like? What do you remember from your youth? And of course, you know, you know, like an example, like kick the can. Hey, I'm pretty sure there are plenty of elderly, of elderly folk remembering their memories of, them remembering their young childhood memories of play, kicking the can around. So that's definitely some, that's definitely something. And and it's got a good thing. It's got a good message. Even though even though you're old, you can still remember your childhood mem your childhood memories and. And, and and Leo Conroy, he'll be able to remember it. And of course, Mr. Bloom says that too. He'll get it. And it's got it's a pretty good message too. I like the message. It's, it's a pretty good message too. I like the message. even though you're old, you can still you, you still have childhood memories from your youth. Then that's good. That's that and that's good. That's a good thing. And that's a good thing. That's a good message. And I like that message. That's a good message. In my opinion, Steven Spielberg did a very good job. Despite, you know, even though he was a producer on the on the whole film, like he still a pretty did a pretty good job. He's he he did a fantastic job with this segment in my opinion. I also just realized that 
Steven Spielberg also uh, directed a uh, a uh, TV pilot that was actually turned into a made-for-TV movie called Night Gallery, which also had Rod Sterling as the narrator. And Night Gallery is a um, well, it's a, it's another science fiction supernatural TV show that is similar to The Twilight Zone. But, but I just realized that uh, Steven Spielberg uh, directed a uh, directed an episode that was that was basically served as a pilot that was basically served as a pilot, but it was a made for TV movie for for Night Gallery, and that sets up the Night Gallery TV show that Rod Serling did back in the back in the late sixties and early seventies. And I just realized that. And look where Steven Spielberg is at right now. He started a, he and one of his early. TV and film projects that he did with Hollywood was 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 Night Gallery. That was one of his early um, that was one of his early projects that he did for, to in the film and TV industry, leading up to where he where Steven Spielberg is right now as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. I, I just completely realized that. And Steven Spielberg himself, I mean, I mean, he had, he also had his fair share of problems too, like. Outside, outside of like outside of his early days in in film in filmmaking, but where he is right now, he he is having a good life. Like Steven Spielberg has a very good life, which reminds me of an of another segment that I should talk about. A it's a good life, to which uh, Joe Dante, to which Joe Dante directed this segment, and and I'll tell you this right now, it's a good life. Like this was this is where it starts to pick up a little bit, like. Like it's a good life, like brings you back into the fold of like of Twilight Zone for a little bit. So, so let's get into Joe Dante's segment, or should I say, the third segment of the Twilight Zone movie called "It's a Good Life." Now, it's a good life. It's a, it's a, it's basically a remake of of an epi- of the episode of the same name, and um, this was made. This is and the screenplay was written by Richard Matheson, and is based on a short story by Jerome Bixby. With Joe Dante serving as the director, you get this opening narration from Burgess Meredith saying, "Portrait of a woman in transit, Helen Foley, age 27, occupation, school teacher. Up until now, the pattern of her life has been one of unrelent of unrelenting sameness, waiting for something different to happen. Helen Foley doesn't know it yet, but her waiting has just ended." So that's the uh, opening narration for It's a Good Life, for, for the remake. So Helen Foley, who is being played by Kathleen Quinlan, she she is traveling to a new job. So basically this new job, like her occupation is a school teacher. So she's basically getting a new job as a school teacher. And while she's traveling, she visits a rural bar for her directions and and while she's in that bar, she's eating the sandwich while also asking for help for asking for help with directions. So she's talking with this waiter or a bartender named Walter Paisley, being played by Dick Miller, and that's his name. Dick Miller is the name of the actor who played Walter Paisley. Who, um, fun fact, he has appeared in, the, in a number of Joe Dante movies, including uh, Roger Corman movies as well. So, so just to let you all know. So she asked the the she asked uh, Walter for like directions or where to go on um, where to go and while she's asking questions she witnessed a, a young boy named Anthony being played by Jeremy Licht and and Anthony's playing playing a um pl- he's playing in an ar- an arcade game and 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 Anthony Anthony was being harassed by a by a couple of local travelers who are watching a boxing match on TV. But the thing is, like, the game that Anthony is playing, like, it causes the TV to break down, be losing connection. And then the two, the, the two, uh, one of the locals, they were about to, like, throw, they were about to throw down, on the, they were about to throw down the boy because An- they were about to throw down on Anthony because Anthony was disrupting their, d- disrupting the boxing match on TV. So they're about ready to throw down this kid. It wasn't until Helen comes to the boys' defense, and and even Walter, Walter, the the, the bartender or, or or the owner, I should say, of the of the bar, comes over and is like, "What's going on? What happened?" So she she was about to so she was able to set the boy free. 
she was able to set Anthony free, and as she was about to leave, like uh, Walter apologizes to uh, Helen, like saying, "Like, look, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what ha I don't know what happened." Like she was about to pay for her sandwich, but but Walter was like, "No, no, 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 no. It's no, no, no. On the house. It's on me. It's on the house." So as the, and and that was actually a very nice thing too. I, I'm glad like the like like the like the the owner or the bartender realizes like the whole situation. Like he's basically sorry for the he's sorry for this incident and. He was able to like tell how like tell him like look don't worry about the payment I I got this covered I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it it's it's on the house like he was being genuine he was being nice to Helen at that very moment he he was being nice and gen and genuine to Helen at that moment after realizing the whole situation between um the two uh locals and the uh, the two locals that were about to throw down on Anthony like like she was able to stop she was able to stop to stop the fight the fight that was about to happen so. So anyway, Helen leaves and Helen le Helen leaves the bar and she accidentally backs into Anthony with her car in the parking lot. Oh damn! Didn't expect that to happen. I mean, she wasn't looking. Like she was she wasn't looking, and this was an accident, by the way. So she she comes out of the car and she to to see if Anthony's okay and and she sees the bike is all damaged. So what she does, Helen offers Anthony a ride home. So they, so Anthony uh, and Helen, well, so Helen drives Anthony to his house, and once she arrives there, she she meets Anthony's family. She meets Uncle Walt, Sister Ethel, and of course Anthony's mother and father. And uh, Uncle Walt's being played by Kevin Kevin McCarthy, and the uh, the father is being played by William Schallert, and while the mother is being played by by Patricia Berry. And some of these actors that I and some of these actors that I mentioned are some of the original cast members from the original Twilight Zone TV show. Most notably Kevin McCarthy, William and William Shaw and William Schallert. Even Bill Mummy had a had a camp Bill Mummy had a had a cameo at the, in the third segment. He played I'm pretty sure and I, if I remember correctly, he played one of the he played one of the one of the locals in that bar. That was about to throw down on Anthony, so I'm pretty sure that was Bill Mummy in that set in that segment, and Ethel, who is basically uh, Anthony's uh, sister, is being played by Nancy Cartwright, who uh, who voiced Bart Simpson in The Simpsons. So, so, th so there's your cast. So there's your cast right there, and um, and anyway, so anyway, uh, they're all greeted by they're all greeted they're all greeted by. Um, by help by Helen and Anthony's family, they're very welcoming to to uh, to Helen. So Anthony starts to show Helen around the house while the family rifle rifles through Helen's purse and coat. This does give you a little hint of what you're about, of what's gonna be ha of what's gonna happen because like like the family, they're going through Helen's purse and coat, wondering like, oh, what's inside? Oh, what's inside the coat? What's inside the purse? Like you get this little uh, cartoon music that is being played in the background. And I'm pretty sure this is Jerry Goldsmith's music that's playing too, because uh, because I found out later because um, Jerry Goldsmith also has done some whimsical scores too, so you get that little whimsical and creepy like uh, creepy like music playing in the background too. So that, that's probably which is probably Jerry Goldsmith's music. So so anyway, uh, Helen goes with Anthony to like take a little tour of the place. She walks upstairs to um, Anthony's room, and what she sees. Is like it's basically a like cartoon room, like well, not like cartoon animation, but like cartoonish. And what we also see is um is uh Anthony's uh other, I'm pretty sure Anthony's other sister in the room. Like she's like she's sitting in this chair watching uh TV, like cartoon, like a cartoon show on TV or a short film, cartoon short film, and um. And she's wondering, like, she's wondering what's going on. And um, this does give you a little hint that this does give you this gives you a little hint of what's gonna be, what's gonna happen throughout the rest of the segment. So, so to keep that, so just so keep that in mind. So, so anyway, um, so anyway, she also noticed Helen noticed that there is a television set in every room showing cartoons. And as I mentioned, um. Uh, she sees uh, uh Anthony's other sister, her other si like Anthony's other Anthony's other sister, and the other sis the other sister is Sarah, by the way, who is sitting in that chair watching TV. 
Helen tries to call out to the girl who is actually in this wheelchair. I thought it was an actual chair, but it was actually a wheelchair watching TV. And she doesn't talk. Sarah does not talk. And the reason being because, uh, well, because Anthony explains that Sarah has been in an accident. And the thing is, that's not the case. It turns out that Sarah's mouth has been shut. So, so Sarah's mouth has been shut and Helen's not able to see, to see it. Like, she doesn't know that the girl's, that the, that Sarah's mouth has been shut. So something's up. Something is up. And as I mentioned, this will build up. This, this is also a thing that will happen throughout the rest of the segment. Now, now anyway, um, Anthony comes back downstairs with Helen and then all the family members, like, were putting away uh, all of Helen's stuff. Like, um, Ethel is, like, smoking, it's, like, smoking, is, like, smoke, is, is smoking, and, uh, the mom is also dabbing herself with what looks to be lotion, and then, um, and then the father, and then what the, the uncle looks, and then what looks like the uncle is, like, smoking as well. So, they all put that stuff away, and, um, and then Anthony announces that it's time for dinner, which consists of ice cream, candy apples, potato chips, and hamburgers topped with pita butter. And at one point, Helen is confused at, at the family's unconventional diet, and and Helen thinks that this is a birthday dinner for Anthony. So that's also brought up in the uh, in the in the in the early part of the segment, like like uh, Anthony tells Helen that it's his birthday, but um, and that's what Helen thinks that too. Now. Well, uh, she's like wondering. Well, she's wondering about this all the food that all the food that that the family's eating, like ice cream, candy apples, potato chips, and hamburgers with peanut butter on top. Okay, uh, peanut butter burgers, peanut butter burgers. Okay, that's something that SpongeBob SquarePants would do. You know, have a Krabby Patty with a peanut butt with peanut butter and jelly. Although I do, although there is an episode where SpongeBob actually made a Krabby Pat made a Krabby Patty with a jellyfish jam on it. So. So there's some, so there's something right there, but uh, but the scene that in real life, um, that is some that is that definitely turns your stuff that that would definitely turn your stomach, I should say, but just saying. But anyway, uh, once uh, Elf, uh but once uh, Helen brought, brings up the birthday portion, uh, Ethel complains at the prospect of another birth birthday. Anthony glares at her. And her plate flies out of her hands. So Anthony, so what we just, so what we just realized is that Anthony is not what what he's seen to be. Like, and you're probably wondering, why? The, what the hell is up with Anthony? Why did he move uh, Ethel's plate out of her hand and and fall? To, and why did that? Why did he use? Why did he move Ethel's plate out out of her hands? Like, what's up with that? But unfortunately, Anthony is like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Yeah, this kid is bad news. Like, oh man, I'm gonna tell you this right now. I don't know what the hell is up with that kid, but but he's too young to to be running the house, though. He's not Kevin McAllister. So anyway, Helen attempts to leave, like because she realizes something's up. She knows something's going on with Anthony, but Anthony urges Helen to stay. See Uncle Walt's hat trick, and this hat trick is basically what else? Pulling a rabbit out of the hat. But Uncle Walt is very nervous of, 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 on what he what, on what could be in the hat, which he pulls out the, a rabbit out of the hat, an ordinary rabbit. But then Anthony insists on an encore, and what happens next is a large mutant rabbit springing out of, out of out of the hat that Uncle Walt is doing this magic trick on, and this rabbit is a demon rabbit. Like this is a demon rabbit. That even Bugs Bunny will piss his rabbit pants on. Basically, like, a, like think about it. Can you think about it? Bugs Bunny was there seeing this demon rabbit po being pulled out out of Uncle Walt's hat, saying, "Yeah, fuck, fuck, put that, put that rabbit, put that scary demon rabbit away. Yeah, you're scaring me, Doc. Yeah." So, so yeah, think about that. Yeah, think about that for a moment. Like, damn, Bugs Bunny will be pissing his own pants if he actually saw that demon rabbit being pulled out of a magic hat. But anyway, Anthony made a, w made a wish on that rabbit, telling the rabbit to go, telling that demon rabbit to go away. And the rabbit, and the rabbit goes away back inside Walt, Walt to Uncle Walt's hat. And Helen attempts to, attempts to leave. Like, she's like, I, I have enough, of, I, she's like, I have enough, of, I, I have enough of these magic tricks. I'm getting out of here. 
like Helen tr attempts to leave, and she even spills the con the contents the contents of her purse, and Anthony finds a note inside stating, "Help us, help us! Anthony is a monster." There's the big reveal right there, folks. Like, uh, Anthony's folks left a note inside Helen's purse say stating, "Help us! Anthony is a monster." So there you go. Anthony is actually a monster. He's a he's an actual monster. Basically, he's controlling the house for himself and controlling his family. Like, what kind of kid does that? Like, what kind of what kind of kid does that? I mean, what's the point of it? What's the point of this kid? Like, why didn't the parents stand up and take charge? Why why was the what's the point of that? Why didn't the parents why why didn't the parents stand up for themselves and you know punish Anthony? Like punish Anthony, like like give Anthony Anthony a timeout. Like why didn't they do that? Why why didn't they do that? But of course, knowing the fact that Anthony is is a monster in this segment. So anyway, um, like the family points the points the finger at Ethel because they believe that Ethel was the one who uh, put the nose inside Helen's purse, and 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 it's also revealed and it's also revealed that that Anthony's Rel at that Anthony's uh, family, Anthony's mo Anthony's mom, Anthony's mother, father, and and uncle, who are being played by Kevin McCarthy, Patricia Berry, William Schallert, and then of course Nancy Cartwright, they are not Anthony's real family or real relatives, and they're not they're not his real relatives, and it's also revealed and it's also revealed that and it's revealed that Anthony brought them to his house. To be his surrogate family after Anthony killed his original parents. How did Anthony kill his original parents? I do not know. And presumably he's going to do the same thing with Helen. Oh my goodness. Anthony's a psychopath. Like, like this whole segment is basically telling you that Anthony is a literal psychopath. Controlling the house and he's going to, and he's, and is basically giving demands. And and basically making his, he's basically giving demands demands to his family. He's basically ordering the family to do this, do that, do this, do that. Then of course, if if the family does not obey Anthony, he'll Anthony would would send them away. I do not know where, but anyway. And of course, with Ethel writing the note to which she put in uh, Helen's purse in punishment for writing the note, Anthony sends Ethel into the television set. Like she wished Ethel to be in a um, cartoon TV series, where and she is set in the, she is put into the TV set where she's pursued and eaten by a cartoon dragon. Oh my goodness, that is that is messed up. This is basically Ethel's personal hellhole, and she's basically in this uh, animation which was actually animated by uh, Sally Cruikshank and. Like the animation that the Ethel was in, like it's animated by Sally Cruikshank, which she does a very good job. She like Sally Cruikshank did a fantastic job with this animation, and this cartoon dragon that come that goes after uh, Ethel, like like this dragon is chasing Ethel until until the dragon finally catches on to Ethel and eats her alive. And then and then what Anthony does, he says that the 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 he goes into Porky Pig mode, saying that 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 that's all Ethel, like. You're not Porky Pig, Anthony. Anthony's not Porky Pig. Oh my goodness. Like, like Anthony just killed his own surrogate sister. Helen attempts to escape again, only to have the door blocked by a giant eye, which basically, which could also resemble the Twilight Zone eye. And Anthony vents his frustration at everyone being afraid of him, summoning another cartoonish monster out of the, televi out of the television. Like, the television starts to break apart like it's breaking apart you hear ca cartoon sound effects and what comes next and what comes next is this cartoonish monster that starts spinning out of control like the tasmanian devil you know the tasmanian devil from movie two is like and that's that's what's going on and that's what's going on because this cartoonish monster is spinning out of control because anthony is venting his frustration Telling, telling, telling everyone in the house, I don't want people to be afraid of me. That's what's happening. Like he doesn't want, he doesn't want his family to be afraid of him or something. 
or, or something like that. Like, but of course, unfortunately, everybody in the house is afraid of Anthony in this segment. So then this cartoonish monster, like, he's scaring everybody in the house, and Helen tells Anthony to wish it away. And, and he does. Anthony wishes it away, but he makes the entire house dis disappear, taking himself and Helen outside the physical plane of existence. So, so, so Anthony or Helen are, are the last two standing. And Anthony says that he sent his family back where they came from, since they did not want him to be with them. He cannot understand why everyone is unhappy with him, since he believes he, provide, he provided for their every possible desire. It's a very sad moment, too. Like, Anthony was able, well, like, Anthony, he didn't kill. He didn't kill, like, he didn't kill the re the rest of his family, although Ethel, I mean, we saw Ethel got eaten alive by the dragon. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if Ethel was sent back with the family. I mean, I'm not really sure about that. She's probably dead. I mean, she's, I'm pretty sure she's dead. I don't know if Anthony was able to wish out of that. I mean, I don't know if Anthony did. But anyway, a Anthony sent his family back to where they came from. So basically back to the, like, to their normal lives. So they're not living with Anthony anymore. And like I said, Anthony cannot understand why everyone's unhappy with him. And since he believes he provided for their every possible desire. And what I really like about this, uh, where I really, really like about this, about the scene where uh, it's just Helen and Anthony in this physical plane of existence, you get this transition edit where it's just basically a cross dissolve. Like it's just like you get this cross dissolve and it's a very good transition technique. And is basically used with two different two different shots put into one put into put into one scene, and it's a very cool technique, and I really like that technique that Joe Dante used in this in this scene. So Helen offers to be Anthony's teacher and student, and to help him find new, even greater uses for his power, and satisfy that she'll never abandon him, and having at least foreseen the true end result of his reign of terror. Anthony welcomes Helen's offer and magically brings back her car. As they drive through a barren landscape, meadows filled with bright flowers spring up alongside the, alongside the road in the pair's wake. Helen offered um, to be Anthony's teacher and student, you know, and to help him, and to help him, to help him build a new, to help him build a new life, learn how to control his powers for, for, for the greater, for, for greater, for greater use. And, and this is basically this is this is a basically a very a very touching moment too. This is a touching moment too. Like now, like now, like Anthony accepts a accepts a Helen's offer. He accepted Helen's offer, knowing the fact that Helen's gonna teach Anthony, and you know, and 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 start a new life together. Like like start a new life together. Like Anthony's life at one point wasn't that good. Wasn't really that good because. Anthony was control was controlling was controlling that life. Now he's gonna right now and and after and and after this very moment when Helen offers to be Anthony's teacher, he like he and Helen are gonna start a new life together. Like like Helen is basically being Anthony's teacher, and I'm pretty sure Helen is gonna be the mother to Anthony if that's the case. If that's the case, I mean teacher yes, but a mother. Maybe I don't know. I'm not. Really, I'm not very really sure, but but I'm pretty sure that's that's how this segment is ending. But anyway, uh, Helen and Anthony are driving off into the sunset, and the beautiful landscape and the meadows are growing growing back with beautiful flowers springing springing alongside the road in the pair's wake. And this is this is uh, at, and this and this is also the this also comes with uh, Jerry Goldsmith's very beautiful and whimsical. Uh, whimsical music like it's a very beautiful score that jerry goldsmith put into for this uh for this last uh for this last scene in in the third segment and it's very beautiful i like the the string the background the musical background from the string section they they provided a very uh, they provided a beautiful melody and it's a happy it's a happy melody and that and and it ha and it's a also and it's also a happy ending as well meaning that Anthony and Helen are going to start a new life together. They're going to they're going to start a new life together, basically like a school life, like where Anthony's the student and Helen's the teacher. 
So, so yeah. And and other than that, I mean, it's a, it's a very good segment. I like the, I actually like this segment, and this is where it picks up a little bit for this movie. Like the movie begins to pick up a little more after this segment. So it was a very so it was a very good segment that they were able, that that the film was able to pick up on. So now we're back on track with with the Twilight Zone movie, and the actors did a very good job. I like the actor like the actors did a very good job, especially Kathleen especially Kathleen Quin, Quinlan. Like she did a very good job portraying uh, Helen Foley, and and the and the other actors did a very good job, too. especially the kid who played uh, Anthony. He he was intimidating as well and creepy too. But at the end, but, but but other than that, he did a very good job playing the kid. He did a very the kid the kid who played the actor who played Anthony in this uh, segment did a very good job as well. Jeremy Jeremy Lick. Which which is basically his name. He did a very good job. He did a very good job playing playing the kid. The musical the musical sequence by Jerry Goldsmith was very good too. Especially I love the moment when during during that uh, magic hat trick with with the demon rabbit. Like like he he like he brings in this uh, creepy whimsical cartoonish music with the with the car horn being played in the background, giving it a very scary vibe, revealing the demon rabbit that's being pulled out of the hats from Uncle Walt. So that was pretty scary too. That was a pretty scary moment too, but 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 also ending, but also putting into cartoonish music during like the cartoon sequences, and of course the beautiful whimsical string section playing this beautiful me- melody during the during the during the end segment with all the flowers growing. That's a very good. That's very good. I really love it. But other than that, but other than that, very good segments for It's a Good Life, and Joe Dante did a very good job. And now we move on to the fourth and final segment of the Twilight Zone movie, and that would be Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. I already mentioned this early in the podcast that Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet is directed by George Miller, and it was written by Richard Matheson, who also wrote the original script for the um, for the original Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. That and that episode starred William Shatner and directed by Richard Donner. This time around with George Miller at the helm, it 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 stars um, it stars John Lithgow, and his name is Mr. John Valentine. To open open the segment up with the fourth and final narration for segment four, according to the narrator from Burgess Meredith, what you're looking at could be the end of a particularly terrifying nightmare. It isn't. It's the beginning. Introducing Mr. John Valentine, air traveler. His destination, the Twilight Zone. So that's the opening narration. And what we get is like how how it opens up with the airplane flying in the air on, on a stormy night. And I like how the camera zooms in and transitions to the to um what appears to be the bathroom, I believe. Where um John Valentine, played by John Lithgow, he is freaking out, trying to recover from a panic attack due to a fear of flying. Like he's freaking out, and and the music from Jerry Goldsmith adds a very haunting march to it. Like like it's so scary too, because knowing the fact that J- that uh, John Valentine is having a panic attack, and this segment opens up very well. This is very good. The segment itself opens up very well. It's, it establishes who John Lithgow's uh, character is and what John Lithgow's character, John Valentine, is dealing with. Like John Valentine has a fear of flying, and while that's go- and while he's freaking out in the bathroom, he noticed that he, the, while he's freaking out, the flight attendants uh, were trying to check on Mr. John Valentine, like because they're flying in, the, in a terrifying thunderstorm, which is violent. It's a very violent thunderstorm by the way they're trying to make sure mr valentine is okay and um and and for the most part he's somewhat okay he was able to like you know take his pills and also like you know trying to douse himself with water and you know just to like wipe off his face and hair you know just to calm himself down so he comes out of the bathroom and then like the, the flight attendants were able to uh help help him walk him back to his seat and have like have they they were going to have Valentine John Valentine sit down in the flight seat just to, you know calm down you know rest up and rest up because obviously they're flying in the nighttime during a violent thunderstorm so 
Um, so, so what, so what Mr. Valentine does, he sits back in the seat, he reads a little bit of the newspaper, notices that a, uh, there was a plane crash from a, for a recent event that happened. I mean, I don't know what event had that happened, but he realizes that there was a plane crash, which definitely, which, de which definitely connects to his fear of flying. While Valentine is sitting in his, in his seat, he noticed, uh, a, um, a stranger on, the, on the wing of the plane. And and he noticed something's up. He he puts on his glasses, looks outside the the window of the wing of of the wing. Like he sees a stranger, but it turns out it it was an it was a gremlin, a hideous gremlin on the wing of the plane. And Mr. John Valentine spirals into another panic attack. And and he watches the creature wreaking havoc on the wing, throwing de debris into one of the plane's turbofan engines and causing a flame out. Like he. He freaks out, like he tells everybody, he tries to get everybody's attention, telling him, so he, guys, guys, there's a man on the plane, there's a man on the plane! Like, he freaks out, like, he freaks out, and what I really like about this moment is the, is not, is not only John Lithgow's acting, like, dude, John Lithgow, he, this is probably one of his best performances, in my opinion, like, he brought in a very good performance, that is a very good performance by John Lithgow. The way how he freaks out, he is scared of this gremlin. That gremlin, that demon from hell, sitting on the wing of the plane, throwing debris inside that turbo fan. That's what this gremlin is doing. Like, this gremlin, this gremlin, that freaking psycho demon, is literally throwing debris inside that plane. And John, and John Valentine is the only one seeing this. Like, he's freaking out. He panics. But everybody on the plane doesn't believe him at one point. They, they don't believe him at one point. So, um, the flight, so first time around, uh, the flight attendant, you know, gives um, John Valentine this little uh, pill. I'm pretty sure it's a sleeping pill, you know, that can help, uh, that can help, that can help make the flight smoother. But then, it, which which he which he takes, but which he takes, and then for a while he he tries to fall asleep for a little bit. And what I really like about this next moment is when, as he's sleeping, the music continues to build suspense. Like you hear Jerry Goldsmith's music, particularly from um, from the string section. From the string section and the string section has got a solo it's got a solo playing in the background and it's it's building suspense it's building that sus suspense moment where uh mr valentine is sleeping but he can't sleep and he wants to look out the window again to see if that gremlin is still there and while that's going on he keeps sleep he tries so hard to sleep until the very moment where he, there's this choir background raising their voices and that comes in when uh, John opens his eyes, and what comes next is the uh, brass section playing this horrifying melody. And as as Mr. Valentine opens the window, and as, once he does that, the gremlin is is there. His face is staring through the window with dead white eyes. And the next moment is this quick cut where it cuts back to John Lithgow. His eyes go white too, and John Valentine freaks out. And the mute and the music goes into this goes into this rhythm. That's the rhythm and theme of the of the of this of this segment for Nightmare Twenty Thousand Feet. It is terrifying as hell. Like Mr. Valentine freaks out. Like and once he and he screams so loud, one of the captains and of course a FAA FAA officer holds down Mr. Valentine holds down Mr. Valentine to calm him down. And, and Mr. Valentine keeps freaking out, and he keeps freaking out. Even all the passengers freak out too because they're wondering what's going on. What's going? What's going on with this dude? With this dude? Why is he screaming? Why is he freaking out? Well, the thing is, he know he knows there's a gremlin on the plane. There's a gremlin on the on the on one of the wing side. Uh, there's a gremlin on on the plane. There's a gremlin on the plane outside on the wing throwing debris inside inside the turbines, and it's crazy too. Hell, it's crazy. My goodness. Everybody thinks that every, everybody on the plane thought that Mr. Valentine is a dumbass. Not really. He, that's not true. Mr. Valentine saw what he saw. And once uh, once uh, Mr. John Valentine calms down, the captain tells uh, Mr. Valentine what's going on. Like, and then Valentine's like, there's something wrong with this plane. There's something wrong with this plane. I know I see this gremlin out there. So the captain's like, Mr. Valentine, please, you gotta calm down. Listen, I know 
flights can be scary this time, but we don't want to freak out all the other passengers. And we will be landing in about a few minutes, so so please hang on tight. So the captain calms him down, but J Mr. Valentine doesn't hold it in. He can't hold it in that long. Like, he, he sees the gremlin again. Like, he knows the gremlin is doing more damage to the turbines. So what he does, he takes this, he, he steal, like, he noticed the plane, the plane's going into turbulent mode. Where everybody's you know hanging out for dear, where everybody's hanging out for dear life. This little girl is bouncing up and is bouncing up and down, and then all the other passengers are just hanging out for dear life, you know, you know, during like this whole uh, turbulence incident. So John Valentine, like, he wants to get proof. He wants proof to to he wants proof. He wants to show everybody on the plane that the gremlin was there. So what he does, he takes the cam, he takes a camera that this little girl had. Uh, during the entire during the entire during the entire uh, plane ride, like he takes the camera, and the girl's like, "Hey, what are you doing? That's very bad manners, you know." So he takes the camera, take takes tries to takes a picture of the gremlin, but unfortunately the picture doesn't come out that good. It only gets his face because like he he he, he was able to get it in the right angle, try to face towards the gremlin, but the way how it how it came out, it's just like you only see the reflection of John Valentine's face. So. So he takes, so what he does, he takes a fire extinguisher, try, tries to break the window. This federal a aviation officer, this federal aviation officer, try to, try to hold him down. But he takes, but he takes the, a, he takes the officer's gun, shoots it at the window, and every, and he, and it starts pulling John Valentine and this aviation officer through the window. Everybody in this plane is freaking out into madness. Like everybody's freaking out to madness, screaming in pain. Everything in that plane started to fall apart. Papers, so many papers fly, flying by. Even all the all the food, the drinks, tables are starting to come apart. Like it's madness. This is pure madness. Like they think that Mr. Valentine's a psycho now. That's not the case. But, well, technically, Mr. Valentine's having this freak out, dude. This is Mad Max level stuff that is going on in this scene. Like. This is the guy, George Miller, the guy who directed the first two Mad Max movies, knew what he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was he knew what he was doing when making the when making this segment. Like he knew the madness that is go, that is going on in this segment, and he d definitely deserves credit. In my opinion, this is the best segment of this film. Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet, best segment of this movie, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, Valentine's basically outside outside of the plane. He sees the sees the gremlin. He shoots at it. Although he it did although none of the bullets hit the gremlin, but the gremlin notices it. It it runs on by, grabs the gun and eats it. The gremlin eats the gun, and then Mr. Valentine's like, oh, 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 I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! This gremlin is real. And boy, that gremlin! I'll tell you this: the design for the gremlin is a lot more frightening. Don't get me wrong, the original gremlin. From the original Nightmare at 20,000 feet was scary, but at the same time, eh, the costume and design was was a bit silly. It, it's like he's he, because this original Gremlin, it looks like he was wearing um like like a wool like costume a little bit. I mean, it's still creepy, but at the same time, a little silly too. This Gremlin from the from the remake of Nightmare at 20,000 feet, the one that came out in 1983, the actual remake, yeah, that's a remake. Nightmare 20,000 feet from 1983 Twilight Zone movie. That's a remake. That gremlin is creepy as hell. It looks like an actual gremlin. Okay, well, technically Joe Dante would would eventually make gremlins after this movie and they they look they look freaky as well. Look, they look like freaky reptiles in Joe da on Joe Dante's take. But anyway, this gremlin about to like, you know, I'm pretty sure he, I think this gremlin was going to kill John Valentine. But unfortunately, the gremlin notices that the tires were coming out of the airplane, realizes that the plane's going to that the plane is going to land. So what he does next, he grabs John Valentine's face for a sec, and and you know just like wondering, he's wondering like, eh, eh, screw this. And then this gremlin gives gives his little finger, wavy finger at um at John Valentine's, saying ah ah ah, and he flies off the wing of the plane. He flies away. We don't see the gremlin again. Obviously, that gremlin's gonna get redesigned for Joe Date's take on the gremlins. And then the plane land. And then the plane lands. So, 
that's it. That's basically it. That's the whole flight sequence for Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. So after the crazy flight, um, John Valentine is is straight is straight jacketed, and he's being carried away in an ambulance, probably to a mental institution or hospital or something or or, some, or something like that. So all the crew members, uh, crew members and passengers got off the plane. They're all freaky out. What happened? Even the federal, even the federal aviation officer was like, was was, was like given the reason why this all happened. Oh, it's claustrophobia. I've seen this happen before because the fact that John John Valentine used his gun to shoot down the window just so he could get, go after that gremlin. But of course, it could be also be for air as well. You know, air. You need air inside a plane. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, like AC, air condition, an air conditioned flight. You know what I'm saying? But everybody's been freaking out. But everybody's been freaking out about it until one of the engineers found found claw marks on the jet turbines, and everybody everybody sees it all. Everybody sees it all, and they're like, "Oh my goodness! Oh my!" They're like, "Oh my goodness!" Knowing the fact that there was an that this actually happened, like that John Valentine was telling the truth. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, the segment ends. The the fourth segment ends like that. But uh, but also what I really like about the segment is this is where Jerry Goldsmith's music was played very well in this segment. It was terrifying. Like it's got this little flight sequence rhythm to it, but at the same time it is very very ter it, but it's terrifying too. Jerry Goldsmith did a very good job with that segment, especially like during the final confrontation between the Gremlin and John Valentine. Like it went into this mel it went into this rhythm it it goes into this rhythm da 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 and 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 it's very good. It's a very good rhythm. It's a good rhythm and a good melody. Like it is terrifying. What what he delivered was terrifying, but good as well. Jerry Goldsmith deserves props for that segment. So after that so anyway, um so for the rest of the, so for the so what happened to uh, Mr. Valentine? Well, obviously being straight jacketed and me taking an ambulance. Well, we get this scene where um, we see John Valentine inside the ambulance and and the uh, and we see the ambulance driver who is actually the car passenger from the prologue, which is Dan Aykroyd's character. Like he uh, turns off the the ambulance uh, sound effect. And um, puts on puts 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 and puts on music, which is a uh, midnight special by Clearden's Clearwater Revival. And John Valentine's like, oh, I like this song. Let the midnight special shine a light on me. Let the midnight special shine a light on me. Like John Valentine likes it. That's a good song, by the way. I really like that song. Like he listens to it and he likes it. And then the, the 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 ambulance driver was like, "So you had a so you had a big scare up there, huh?" John Valentine was like, "Yep, that was a big yep, a big scare." And then the and then the ambulance driver asked John Valentine, "You want to see something really scary?" And that's the final quote. That's the final line from 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 Dan Aykroyd, <laughs> from Dan from Dan Aykroyd's character and. What we get next is a close-up shot on John Valentine's face with the Twilight Zone theme music playing in the background, realizing what's going to happen. Like, he, And John Valentine's is like, something scary? Oh, no. Like, he, he knows he knows he's going to go for another freakout. But the shot cuts away to the ambulance driving driving away to, I'm pretty sure it was a mental hospital, a mental hospital or a mental institution. And... The camera pans up. It pans up from the streets to the stars up in space, with a uh, with the narration from with with the narration from um, none other than uh, from from not Burgess Meredith but Rod Serling, which is uh, an archive audio recording of one of his narrations. And uh, here's the, here's what he said: There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space. And as timeless as infinity, it is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. And it ends with the credits rolling in. And that's it. That is the Twilight Zone movie. 
Oh my goodness, was that a lot to get through. I never thought I would be talking about a movie divided into four segments like that. Like, there is a lot to unpack in this movie. Like, there is so much ground to cover. Look, I, I, I personally enjoyed this movie, in my opinion. I mean, I had fun watching this movie. It is a de it's a decent movie, in my opinion. Like, I understand why a lot of people didn't like this movie because of the helicopter accident. And, uh, by the way, rest in peace to uh, Vic Maul, man. Like, in my opinion, Vic Maul did a very good job in that segment, despite the, despite the entire, despite the entire, the entire outcome that happened during during that segment. He did a fantastic job with, with the with the first segment, and then all the other actors did a very good job with their roles too. I mean, Scatman Crothers did a fantastic job in the second segment. Same with Kathleen Quinlan, and of course the child actor who played Anthony. John Lithgow did a fantastic job in his segment too. Like, I think John Lithgow had the best performance in the fourth segment. And I heard a lot of people said the third and fourth segments were the best parts of this movie. So like the second half of this movie was obviously the best part of the movie. Like the second half was very good. But in my opinion, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet was obviously the best segment from this movie. Like Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, best segment from this movie. Now, in my opinion, overall, I still enjoyed this movie. It's still a decent movie. All the actors did a fantastic job, despite the entire outcome that happened. Joe Dante, George Miller, and Steven Spielberg did a fantastic job doing their best to, you know, get this film together and make it, make it the best as possible. But the overall execution, I can understand why this movie didn't do as well with many people because of the accident like everybody who has heard of this accident and seen this movie will remember this movie because of the accident everybody's gonna remember this movie because of it well what about the other segment is anybody gonna remember the segments like i mean barely barely anybody remembers some of the segments but i know a lot but i heard a lot of people said they like the third and fourth segments and that's good and some people said some people said they also enjoyed the little bit of the second segment too and that's totally fine. Now, the first segment, though, I'm as I mentioned about the first segment, it's well acted and well structured. But what went down behind the scenes? It was bad. It was real bad. Despite what happened behind the scenes, the segment was well acted and well and well structured. And this is a this is going to be a controversial take. If you take the helicopter accident away from this first segment, like let's just say the helicopter accident did not happen. Let's just say that. Let's just say that. Let's take the helicopter accident out of out of your mind for, for a bit. Let's just say that did not happen. I think John Landis did a good job on this segment, in my opinion. Without the helicopter accident, without it, like think about it for a second. Like you take the helicopter accident out of the picture and you see this segment as a good se as a good segment that John Landis directed. But with that being said, for what went down behind the scenes. That helicopter, that helicopter accident, in my opinion, it hurt John Landis' segment. It hurt, it hurt the segment so much. Now I understand that there's gonna be, there's gonna be people who thought, who who would enjoy this movie, who would enjoy this movie, and I can understand that. I can understand that. If you like this movie, seen this movie, but you end up liking this movie, that's totally fine. I understand that. Even though, yes, what went down behind the scenes was bad. But at the end of the day, but but at the end of the day, really, it is it is a film that literally made changes to Hollywood. Like the film alone, well, particularly the accident, it literally made a lot of changes into Hollywood. Most notably, putting in putting in safety perce safety precautions and procedures for for what's to come and for what's to come. And of course, um, and, and of course, uh, Steven Spielberg cutting ties with John Landis. Because John Landis, John Landis handled the situation poorly, by the way. Overall, I still enjoy this movie. I still enjoy this movie despite what happened behind the scenes. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be people who, who will probably enjoy this movie too. Even though what, what they already know behind the scenes. But at the end of the day, really. I mean, it's still a decent movie. It's still a decent movie. And I think... Uh, for what for, for what would happen, I think everybody did their best. I, I feel like all the directors did their best to make this movie work. They did their best to make this movie work, and somehow the execution was 
a little was sloppy because of what happened, but it's still it's still delivered in a decent way, you know, just to like get people's attention to, you know, like the movie, especially the second half of the movie as well. But other than that, the the acting was good, the music was good, the story idea was good. Being in an anthology movie, being in an anthology movie, that's a very good idea. It's just a it's just a shame of how it ended up, how the entire movie ended up as being a uh, being notorious for the accident. It is sad and heartbreaking to know what, what went down with this movie because this could have been a very good movie. Twilight Zone the movie could have been a very good movie. It could have it could have been it could have been a very good movie. Like it would have gotten a lot of Oscar buzz, but no, it did not because of what went ha- what went down behind the scenes. If that entire helicopter accident did not happen, this movie would have turned out way different than it, than it would have been. It would have turned out way different than what we got. But anyway, that's all. That's that's a wrap for this episode. So, so what do you all think? So what do you what do you all think? What did you think of Twilight Zone the movie? Have you seen this movie? Did you like the movie? Did you think the movie was okay? Like, I would like to hear your thoughts on this movie. I, I like to hear your thoughts on this matter. So. Anyway, that's a wrap on this episode. Thank you all for tuning in to Kodo Cinema. I'm your host, Mark Kodo, a.k.a. Kodo Man. Remember to watch movies, stay positive, and good night. Until next week.